Welcome back everyone to the deep dive. Um, today we're taking a deep dive into the world of MRSA. Oh, MRSA. Yeah, a topic that uh, that you've been researching and we're here to kind of help you sift through it all. And, you know, it's interesting mm -hmm. how many people actually mistake those early MRSA infections. Oh, yeah. For spider bites. It's true. They uh, The early symptoms can be very similar, wow. but while a spider bite might just be a nuisance, right. MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus can be a much bigger problem, especially for those with compromised immune system. Right. It's not your average staph infection. So yeah. what makes MRSA so different? And yeah. frankly, a bit scarier. Well, staph bacteria are pretty common. They live on our skin and even in our noses, usually without causing any harm. Yeah. But MRSA is a strain of staph that's evolved to resist many of our frontline antibiotics. So it's like it's leveled up in the germy world. Exactly. And yeah. that's why it's so important to understand how it spreads. Okay. You see, it's not typically airborne, like a cold or flu. Right. Instead, it moves through direct contact. Okay. Like touching an infected wound or indirect contacts, like sharing towels or equipment. Okay. So it's all about that close contact that yeah. makes me think about athletes, people in gyms, or even kids in school. You're right on the money. Okay. We often categorize MRSA into two main types. HA MRSA, which stands for Healthcare Associated MRSA, okay. and CA MRSA, which is Community Associated. So HA MRSA is the one we traditionally associate with hospitals. That's right. Okay. HA MRSA tends to affect individuals who are already in a healthcare setting, mm. often dealing with weakened immune systems or recovering from procedures. Yeah. It's been a challenge in hospitals for a long time. Right. And then CA MRSA is the one that's out in the community. Right. What's the story there? CA MRSA is what's been shaking things up. Okay. It's found a foothold outside of hospitals yeah. popping up in places like gyms, yeah. locker rooms, and dormitories. Right. It often affects healthy individuals. Mm. particularly those in close contact and with maybe miter cuts or abrasions. So even if you're feeling great, those small wounds could be a welcome mat for MRSA. Unfortunately, yes. Okay. That's why being aware of MRSA and understanding the symptoms is so important. Right. Early detection can make a huge difference in treatment outcomes. Speaking of symptoms, let's talk about those early signs. How can you differentiate a potential MRSA infection from something like, say, a spider bite, mm. which you mentioned is a common mistake. It can be tricky. Yeah. Because those initial symptoms often mimic a spider bite or other bug bite. Yeah. Redness, a small bump, maybe some itching. Yeah. However, if you notice that redness spreading, okay. increasing pain swelling, or even pus-filled boils or blisters forming, yeah. that's when it's time to seek medical attention immediately. So it's really about monitoring the progression of those symptoms, mm -hmm. right? If things are getting worse, it's a red flag. Absolutely. And if you develop a fever along with those skin symptoms, that's another indication that something more serious might be going on. Okay, so you head to the doctor with a suspicion of MRSA. How do they actually go about diagnosing it? Um, Is it something they can visually identify or are there specific tests involved? Well, a doctor might have a strong suspicion based on the appearance of the infection. Okay. They'll need to confirm it with lab tests to be certain. Right. They'll likely take a sample. This could be from the wound itself. Okay. Or they might take a blood or urine sample, depending on the type of infection. So they're trying to isolate those pesky MRSA bacteria. Exactly. They'll culture that sample. Right. It's essentially letting any bacteria present multiply. And then they can identify whether it is indeed MRSA and critically test its susceptibility to various antibiotics. That makes sense. But what about those folks who are carrying MRSA yeah. but aren't actually sick themselves? You mentioned these carriers earlier. How do doctors go about finding them? MRSA carriers are tricky yeah. because they can unknowingly spread the bacteria even without having symptoms. Right. For those who might be at higher risk of being a carrier, mm. doctors can perform a simple nasal swab. Okay. It might sound odd, yeah. but MRSA frequently takes up residence in the nasal passages. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's a quick and painless way to determine if someone is unknowingly harboring and potentially spreading MRSA. That's fascinating. So even if you feel fine, you could still be a silent spreader. Exactly. That makes prevention all the more important. Now, we can't talk about MRSA without addressing the elephant in the room, antibiotic resistance. 
How does that factor into the MRSA story? Antibiotic resistance is a major concern worldwide. Right. And MRSA is a prime example of how it can complicate things. Yeah. It's vital that we use antibiotics responsibly and mm -hmm. only when absolutely necessary. So no pressuring your doctor for antibiotics when you have a cold or the flu. Right. Exactly. Antibiotics only work against bacteria, not viruses. Right. Taking them unnecessarily just contributes to the problem of resistance. And this is a big one. Okay. If you are prescribed antibiotics, oh. you absolutely must finish the entire course as directed. Okay. Even if you start feeling better before you've taken all the pills. Why is it so crucial to finish the whole course even if you're feeling better? Think of it like a battle. Okay. If you stop the antibiotic attack prematurely, you might allow some of the stronger, more resistant bacteria to survive. Okay. Those survivors then have a chance to multiply, making future infections even harder to treat. So in essence, you're accidentally training them to become superbugs. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's a bit like a microscopic arms race. Now, if you're in a hospital, it seems like the risk of encountering MRSA would be higher. Are there specific things people can do to protect themselves in those environments? Hospitals have strict protocols in place to minimize the spread of MRSA. Yeah. But you can definitely be proactive. Don't hesitate to remind healthcare workers to wash their hands before they touch you. Right. And don't be afraid to ask about their infection control practices. Sometimes it feels awkward to speak up, but in that setting, it's totally appropriate. We've talked a lot about preventing MRSA, but what about those who are already infected? What can they do to prevent spreading it to others? That's a crucial question. Yeah. If you're dealing with an MRSA infection, taking those extra precautions is vital. Right. Keeping any wounds covered with clean, dry bandages is critical to prevent direct contact. Contain and conquer. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hand hygiene goes without saying, both for the person with MRSA and for anyone coming into close contact with them. And while sharing is usually a good thing, it's a hard no when it comes to personal items like towels, razors, or clothing that may have touched infected skin. So it's all about limiting those opportunities for MRSA to spread. It sounds like doing laundry properly is a big part of that. Too. Absolutely. Okay. Washing potentially contaminated items separately with hot water and detergent. Mm. And drying them thoroughly in a hot dryer whenever possible is a key step. And don't forget about those high-touch surfaces around the house. Yeah. Like doorknobs, countertops, and light switches. Those germ hotspots. It's amazing how something we often overlook can play such a role in transmission. You're right. Disinfecting those surfaces regularly can really help minimize the risk of spreading MRSA. It seems like being diligent about those often overlooked cleaning habits can make a real difference when it comes to MRSA. Yeah. I'm curious, we've talked about preventative measures for those with active MRSA infections, but are there preventative treatments for people who are simply carriers, especially in high-risk environments like hospitals? That's a great point. And yes, in hospital settings where the stakes are higher, even MRSA carriers might receive preventative treatment to reduce the risk of spreading the bacteria. What would that kind of preventative treatment look like? It could involve things like topical ointments applied to the skin or even inside the nose to target the bacteria. Okay. Or they might be advised to use a special antibacterial soap for their daily showers. So even if someone isn't showing symptoms, hospitals might take these extra steps to manage the risk of MRSA transmission. It's all about being proactive. Exactly. Right. It's about recognizing that MRSA is a persistent challenge and that even seemingly healthy individuals can unknowingly play a role in its spread. We hope this deep dive into the world of MRSA has been informative and maybe even a bit eye-opening. Remember, stay curious, stay informed, and stay healthy. And remember, knowledge is power when it comes to your health. Until next time, keep diving deep.